Blog Talk Radio. Hello, friends, and thank you for joining me this day, the Sabbath, where we're going to be speaking about the last days, and I'm going to be bringing to you uh, a number of varying texts from myriad sources, and I'm hoping that you will write them down or at least at some point uh, look all of these individual scriptures and and the content and the scope that they're found in uh, from their original Um, manuscripts uh, so that you can understand the connections and the parallels that I'm going to bring forth here. I'm not going to be able to cover a lot of these texts in their entirety, and I will be just really um, just touching small, minuscule parts of what is um, the broader context as far as the fullness of these manuscripts and um, and I would definitely recommend, if you have time, if you have space, if you're a seeker of truth and you want to know for yourself um, about all of the things that I'm going to be covering here, look them up for yourselves. I'll definitely take time to um, mention them in, slowly so that you can capture and write them down if, if you know, if necessary, and also because we're we're definitely not going to have enough time today to cover all of what I would like to cover. So I, I'm planning on doing a series to so I can cover in fullness all the things that I want to try to bring forth in this show. There's so much. You now, once you have started to look into all the myriad texts that are 
you know, freely available to us with the broad reach of the Internet, um, there's so much out there. There's so many books, thousands even. And I am still, you know, having been a student of most of them for decades even now, I've read many, many, many individual texts from all over the world, different mythologies, extra biblical books, um, and there are still texts coming to light almost seemingly daily. And so it's hard to keep up with the amount of knowledge that is being poured out on this generation. And, you know, the Father said that he would be pouring out the Spirit onto all people, onto all flesh. And so there is definitely, and it's almost overwhelming, especially for those of you that have not begun to um, look into the all these various texts. It's, it's almost like you really don't have time. Um, and so, you know, I appreciate those of you that are grateful for, the work that I do in trying to bring as many of these to you as I possibly can because I want you to at least know about them so that you can review them for yourself, delve into them for yourself because it's my opinion, as I said and stated before, that really we're trying to um, solve a, a crime. You know, we're trying to solve a crime and that crime is that knowledge has been stripped away from us, has stolen from us, uh, has been kept from us by an elite group that is trying to keep you dumbed down, trying to keep you distracted and away from knowing not only the Father and the Son uh, and having a relationship with them, but knowing about the fallen angels, the giants, uh, the seed line of Cain, the lineage of the serpent, and what the context of Genesis 3.15, um, where there would be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, what this means in fullness for our lives, and especially for those of us that find ourselves incarnated into the flesh now as being the last generation. Uh, as the fig tree generation, we are going to see the unfolding of all things. And as Christ said, uh, he is going to reveal those things which have been kept secret since the foundations of the world. And so those of you like myself that are doing the work that we're trying to do in uh, awakening people to remembrance of their self and who they are, why they're here, what all of this is about, um, Yahushua bless all of you in your struggle. I know that, you know, like myself, many of my friends, my loved ones, even family members, uh, consider me totally crazy and just, you know, have uh, off the wall and I've lost, you know, my sanity somewhere. That's, you know, that's basically what we are having to deal with because those of us that have awakened up to the strange nature of what we are, you know, living in and dealing with as far as the reality and uh, it's because it's completely unlike what we have been taught as children. Um, all of the esoteric aspects of those things that are covered within the Word, they're not spoken about in the mainstream churches. They're not reviewed. They're, you know, barely even if they are talked about, they're glossed over in such a way that they, those that address them don't address them in a serious manner and certainly don't put together the fullness of the picture so that you can have discernment on all things. And so God bless all of those that are doing the work to wake people up in the in this you know late day and age where so many are are suffering and so many really are looking for those that have the answers. Those that have been raised up by the Father and the Son to be watchmen uh, to be the foot washers, to sound the alarm, to to you know blow the trumpet, and, and to assist you in this day and age to to come to better understanding. You know, Christ told us to know thyself, and so that's what 
all of this is really about. And so I'm going to begin with um, a passage from the Colburn Bible because it will be basically the shortest from the various texts that I'm going to be going into. And then I'm going to try to cover after that the prophecy of the the blue and red star of China in its fullness, and then I'm going to parallel and tie together passages from various extra-biblical and, um, you know, pseudepigraphal, apocryphal, Nagamati books to connect to really what is the fullness of this revelation on the end of days. And so... Welcome, Georgia, and welcome, Jennifer, and Mustang Sally, and Watcher Ruth, Forefront, all of the guests. Uh, I appreciate all of you, Rose, Son of Yahweh, uh, Peace333. Um, I'm grateful. Jasmine, all of you, I'm grateful for your fellowship, and I'm proud to call you friends. All right, we're going to begin with... Um, As I said, this is going to be from the Colburn Bible, Chapter 5. It's called The Destroyer, Part 3. It's from the Scroll of Adepha, the Colburn Bible. For those that are interested, it came out in 2006. It's a huge body of work, many books of wisdom. Know that it is written from the Celtic uh, and the Egyptian priesthood. Druidic priesthood from their perspective and point of view, but as a book of reference, it's incredible in scope as far as its history and all the teachings that are contained within, but know that they do deny Christ as being the only begotten Son of God and the way and the truth and the like. So just, you know, a little bit of discernment there. But again, as I said, in, in revealing uh, the history and the serial, uh, several by, um, passerbys of the destroyer and the influence that it had upon our planet, it is incredible in scope and it's very poetic in, in um, interpretation. So, beginning with this scroll, it says this. The doom shape called the destroyer in Egypt was seen in all the lands whereabout. In color, it was bright and fiery, in appearance changing and unstable. It twisted about itself like a coil, like water bubbling into a pool from an underground supply, and all men agree it was a most fearsome sight. It was not a great comet or a lucent star, being more like a fiery body of flame. Its movements on high were slow. Below, it swirled in the manner of smoke, and it remained close to the sun, whose face it hid. There was a bloody redness about it, which changed as it passed along its course, it caused death and destruction in its rising and setting. It swept the earth with gray cinder rain and caused many plagues, hunger, and other evils. It bit the skin of men and beasts until they became mottled with sores. The earth was troubled and shook. The hills and mountains moved and rocked. The dark smoke filled heavens um, filled heavens bowed over earth and a great howl came to the ears of men born to them upon the wings of the wind real quick commentary in reading these various passages you will see many similarities to the um, the Day of the Lord as written about in Revelation because, again, it's my opinion that the destroyer or Planet X or Nibiru, whatever you want to call it, Wormwood, that it will have part to play in the pouring out of the wrath of God on those not written 
into the books of life. So, uh, that being said, I'm going to continue on. It was the cry of the Dark Lord, the master of dread. Thick clouds of fiery smoke passed before him, and there was an awful hail of hot stones and coals of fire. The doom shape thundered sharply in the heavens and shot out bright lightning. The channels of water were turned back unto themselves when the land tilted and great trees were tossed about and snapped like twigs. You know, for those of you that are waiting for a pole shift, uh, this, you know, seems to have happened previously. Uh, It even speaks about in the book of Enoch that during the time of Noah's flood that the land tilted and the stars changed position, you know, could be connected to the return of the destroyer. Then a voice like 10,000 trumpets was heard over the wilderness, and before its burning breath, the flames parted. The whole of the land moved and mountains melted. The sky itself roared like 10,000 lions in agony, and bright arrows of blood sped back and forth across its face. Earth swelled up like bread upon the hearth. This was the aspect of the doom shape called the destroyer. When it appeared in days long gone by, in olden times, it is thus described in the old records, a few of which remain. It is said that when it appears in the heavens above, the earth splits open from the heat like a nut roasted before the fire. Then flames shoot up through the surface and leap about like fiery fiends upon black blood. The moisture inside the land is all dried up. The pastures and cultivated places are consumed in flames, and they and all trees become white ashes. The doom shape is like a circling ball of flame which scatters small, fiery offspring in its train. It covers about a fifth part of the sky and sends writhing, snake-like fingers down to earth. Before it, the sky appears frightened, and it breaks up and scatters away. Midday is no brighter than night. It spawns a host of terrible things. These are things said of the destroyer in the old records. Read them with a solemn heart, knowing that the doom shape has its appointed time and will return. It would be foolish to let them go unheeded. Now, men say... Such things are not destined for our days. May the great God above grant that this be so. But come, the day surely will, and in accordance with his nature, man will be unprepared. Again, that's uh, from the Colburn Bible, Chapter 5, dealing with the destroyer, which the Colburn, that's the name that it gives to what is cited as Wormwood in Revelation, uh, what is called the Blue Star, Red Star Kachina of the Hopi Prophecy, which I am about to go into, um, Nibiru, Planet X, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same thing. It's been here before, and it's cited in prophecy to return again. Now, um, I want you to know, especially for the listening audience, I'm coming up on what I think will be the conclusion of my seventh book, and I have decided on a title. I'm going to call it Skyfall, Angels of Destiny, Preexistence, and the Predestinated Soul or Spirit. So that will be the title of the new manuscript and the new book. 
I was supposed to turn it into tape on uh, April 22nd. Um, the King, the Lord, the Father, the Son willing, I will be done with it. I'm trying to go through the final edit now, and then I will submit it to them. Of course, Tate has a certain process where it will take a, um, a long period of time to get to you as far as um, being released to the public in book form uh, as a finished product, but know that I am trying to finish it in, in you know as quick as I can. And I've already decided on what I will be working on as far as my eighth book. And that book will have will have to do with the destroyer, Planet X, and the last days. And I'm going to put together in entirety all of the various manuscripts that are related to the last days and to the end time. And there's many of them. And you'll, you'll hear about a lot of what will be contained in that work in the context of this show today. Because, you know, the, just with what I have, the references that I have, on the destroyer from the Colbram Bible in itself would make a small book. And then putting it together with this prophecy and uh, all of the extra biblical books and the pseudepigraphal, the apocryphal texts that deal with the last days, it, it's going to be a, a major undertaking. So I'm hoping that, you know, I can get this one that done that I'm working on now and that I'll be able to you know get that one done in a timely fashion and present it to you with the massive amount of information that I have connected to and relevant to the things that many of you want to know about um, and so uh, I'm going to make that available at some point all right, let me check the chat room real quick, and then we'll continue on with the Hopi prophecy. Um, uh, I'm hoping um, that the title that I decided on, um, well, I hope that everybody likes it, and that I hope that, you know, it will capture the essence of what I want to convey because there's so much already that I'm writing about in this seventh book. Um, and I still have much to do, but... All right, let's continue on. If you have any questions, of course, just put them into the chat room. I will try to answer them as I go along. All right. Continuing. Now I'm going to be reading from what was cited in 1994 by Dr. Robert Ghostwolf in his book, Last Cry. If you want to read the prophecy for yourself, it is contained in that book, which I have one of the copies from a long time ago. Um, um, but this is only one part of what I will be going, you know, what that book contains and what it covers. But the reason I'm going to be reading from this particular prophecy, and I'm going to try to read most of it in its fullness, uh, because it's connected to what I just read as far as the Colvin Bible. And then we'll go into some biblical texts, which also parallel and give confirmation to what I'm going to be reading from. And uh, for those that are new to the show, because we have a lot of new listeners a lot of people that are just discovering my work. Um, I'd like to give this information in the various pieces, you know, what I can of them, um, because as the word says, as the gospel says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses shall the truth be established. And so, these individual texts will be confirming witness for each other on the prophecies of the end of days. 
of the last days, which we find ourselves in now. So, beginning the prophecies on the blue and red star Kachina. It says this. The story of the blue Kachina is a very old story, very old. I, and this is Robert Ghostwell speaking. I'm going to be reading, quoting from him and his testimony on this prophecy. I've been aware of the story of the Blue Kachina since I was very young. I was told this story by grandfathers who are now between 80 and 100 years of age. Frank Waters also wrote about Sequoshua, the Blue Star Kachina, in the book of the Hopi. The story came from Grandfather Dan, who is the oldest Hopi. It was told to me that first the blue Kachina would start to be seen at the dances and would make his appearance known to the children in the plaza during the night dance. This event would tell us that the end times are very near and then the blue star Kachina would physically appear in our heavens, which would mean that we were in the end times. In the final days, we will look up in our heavens, and we will witness the return of the two brothers who helped create this world in the birthing time. Now, I want to I speak about this, what he's talking about right here as helping to create this world. I cover this in my sixth book in the, uh, based on the Genesis timeline because in what he's speaking about is how the father, Yahushua uh, and Yahweh uh, Elohim, how they utilized Nibiru and allowed it to be captured and become part of this solar system, this planetary system, and that when it first became part of this particular system, it was brought into confrontation with Tiamat, or what is cited in um, cited in Job as Rahab. It's, this planet was also known as Maldek. But anyways, this was the original Earth. This was the planet. It was a watery planet. And remember in Genesis when it speaks about uh, there was a time where the earth was enveloped in a watery canopy and the stars were unable to be seen and that the earth was um, uh, watered by a mist, uh, from a mist that rose up from the earth. This was this particular planet, Tiamat, that I'm speaking about. And it was after the destruction of this planet that the water canopy surrounding the planet, this was also before there was rain, that all of the things, you know, the seeing, um, seeing of the stars, being able to see the constellations and the celestial heaven, uh, heavens, that's what was talking about as the reformation, the reconstruction of the planet, uh, the Tohu Wabohu speaking about in Genesis, where the earth became null and void. So that's what he's speaking about here. Of course, I don't think he knows that, you know, that is what is connected to all those things that I just mentioned. But in my work and the research that I've done, this is the discernment that the Father has led me to and bringing forth this information. And so, um, for those that are still new to my work, when this planet was destroyed, then this is the planet where the asteroid belt now is. This planet switched orbital position with Mars, and it was placed into where we currently you know, are, where the new Earth, uh, cited as the Sumerians as being key. This is the new planet, and this is also the uh, incident that is cited in Jeremiah as being the destruction of the first world age. 
All of these things are in my books. You'll have to look into those for further detail on what it is I'm talking about here. But just know that that's what Robert Ghostwolf is talking about when he says that, um, where it says, we will witness the return of the two brothers who helped create this world in the birthing time. Um, continuing. Poga, Pogang Hoya is the guardian of our North Pole, and his brother, Palangawa Hoya, is the guardian of the South Pole. In the final days, the Blue Star Kachina will come to be with his nephews, and they will return the Earth to its natural rotation, which is counterclockwise. Now, another passage from the Colburn Bible, which for those that are interested in reading a little bit more about the destruction of the First World Age, the Colburn Bible also cites this particular incident and gives a very eloquent description of what occurred during that particular time. It's called the, the creation and recreation. But anyways, um, what is interesting about that particular passage that I'm citing about the destruction of the first world age is that it says this, and this will give confirmation that, you know, Nibiru is followed by other bodies, which was interesting to me because um, until I had read this reference, I had thought the destroyer to be just a singular object, but it is not. It is um, multiple. So it says this, and this is, again, a quote from the Colburn Bible just to give confirmation of this um, what is cited in this prophecy. It says this. The first sky monster was joined by another which swallowed the tail of the one going before. But the two could not be seen at once. The sky monster reigned and raged above earth, doing battle to possess it. But the many-bladed sword of God cut them in pieces. And their falling bodies enlarged the land and the sea. In this manner, the first earth was destroyed by calamity, descending from out of the skies. The vaults of heaven had opened to bring forth monsters more fearsome than any that ever haunted the uneasy dreams of men. So I just wanted to give you that reference. And if I have time, like I said, uh, Yahushua willing, my next book will put all of this information together in it. And, um, you know, if, if we make it to that point, it will be an incredible um, book that connects all of these things together and I will elaborate more upon, you know, the things that I just talked about. Let me check the chat room real quick and we'll continue. Uh, Jennifer is asking if I would take calls. Uh, yes, I will. I will take calls, but just give me some time. I'll try to leave space at the very end of the show, um, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, don't call now, Brian. I, I need. There's a lot of information that I need to go through. Wait till about the last 15 minutes, and then we'll take your call. Unless it's relevant to what um, what it is I'm speaking about right now. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and see what Brian has to say. Hello, uh, hello Brian. Are you there? Yes, I am here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to speak about the uh, what you were talking about just now. Um, basically, what happens when we're talking about uh, the astronomical forces that goes on um, outside uh, the borders of our world, um, that the, the moon's anus 
is Hitler's joke. Niggers, niggers, okay, niggers. Okay, dude, yeah, whatever. Uh, he's a, he's just a troll, so we're going to um, kick him from the chat room. So He's one of those that's just to try to disrupt the call. So, anyways, yeah, so sad. So we're not going to take calls from people like that, and I apologize for, you know, his idiocy. So, anyways, we're going to continue on. All right. I apologize that we have people like that trying to, you know, disrupt the show and always trying to uh, cause problems. And that's one of the reasons why I decided a long time ago to not take calls uh, because we get, you know, um, we get people like that trying to take up space and time. Anyways, so I kicked them from the chat room. If we get more people like that, please just, let me know, those of you that I trust, um, and I'll, I'll just kick them out as soon as I can. But know that I'm a one-man show, so I'm trying to, um, you know, bring forth this information. And when I do, I don't have time to monitor the chat room. So, anyway, continuing on. About the, the destroyer. This fact is evidenced in many petroglyphs that speak of the zodiac and within the Mayan and Egyptian pyramids. The rotation of the earth has been manipulated by not so benevolent star beings. The twins will be seen in our northwestern skies. They will come and visit to see who still remembered the original teachings, flying in their Potawabotas or flying shields. They will bring many of their star family with them in the final day. Now, I'm going to comment about this because I've been teaching for a very long time now about how it is that the strong delusion will be connected to the ancient aliens being uh, cited as the creator's the benefactors, the gods of humanity. And that the, even the History Channel and the ancient, on the series on the ancient aliens, that's the premise that they're trying to set up. Even, you know, with the whole theory of evolution, you watch, they're going to say that the missing link is that the star brothers or the Anunnaki, the fallen angels, uh, the demonic presence as cited in the book of Enoch, that these beings are the creators of humanity and that it was their interdiction and their creating so-called uh, so manipulating the DNA and the doing the genetic experimentation that brought us into being. And that is false. That's a fallacy. It's totally not true. It, they did, in fact, you know, they did manipulate and try to create a slave race. But this particular individual that they worked on was a pre-Adamic type of Bigfoot type preacher. And the father judged them, destroyed Atlantis, and, you know, many times other, you know, brought judgment against them many times for the things that they were trying to do. And so um, you will see that that will be the premise that so many will be trying to establish that these particular fallen angels are our creators. And so many that follow the New Age teachings that are involved and, and don't have discernment on the gospel and the things that are taught in the word, they will be willing to bow down before these fallen angels. Let me make sure that we don't have any more trolls in the chat room. Okay. All right, continuing.
The return of the Blue Star Kachina, who is also known as Nanga Sohu, will be the alarm clock that tells us of a new day and new way of life, a new world that is coming. This is where the changes will begin. They will start as fires that burn within us, and we will, and we will burn up with the desires and conflicts if we do not remember the original teachings and return to the peaceful way of life. Not far behind the twins will come the purifier. Now, this is what is cited in the Coleman as being the destroyer or in Revelation as being Wormwood. The red Kachina, who will bring the day of purification. On this day, the earth, her creatures, and all life as we know it will change forever. There will be messengers that will precede this coming of the purifier. They will leave messages to those on earth who remember the old ways. The message will be found written in the living stone through the sacred drains and even the waters. From the purifier will issue forth a great red light. All things will change in their manner of being. Every living thing will be offered the opportunity to change from the largest to the smallest thing. Those who return to the ways given to us in the original teachings and live in natural way of life will not be touched by the coming of the purifier. They will survive and build the new world. Only in the ancient teachings will the ability to understand the messages be found. The appearance of the twins begins a period of seven years will Seven years will be our final opportunity to change our ways. Just like it says uh, that tribulation will be seven years, same thing here. Everything we experience is all a matter of choice. Many will appear to have lost their souls in these final days. So intense will the nature of changes be that those who are weak in spiritual awareness will go insane, for we are nothing without spirit. They will disappear, for they are just hollow vessels for anything to use. Life will be so bad in the cities that many will choose to leave this plane, some in whole groups. Reminds me of Heaven's Gate, you know, with the, the mass suicide of all those people together believing that that was the way that they were going to be able to join the space brothers that had come in a comet for them. You know, for those that don't know, look up Heaven's Gate. That's part of the insanity that will be repeated in the days that we find ourselves in. Only those who return to the values of the old ways will be able to find peace of mind. For in the earth we shall find relief from the madness that will be all around us. It will be very hard time for women with children, for they will be shunned, and many of the children in these times will be unnatural. Reminds me of uh, Genesis 6. You know, with the matings of the sons of God, with the daughters of man, the creation of the giants, how the giants could not even be birthed naturally, but they split open the bellies of their mothers. Some being from the stars, some from past worlds, some will even be created by man in an unnatural manner and will be soulless. Can you use talk about you know, or connect that with what's going on in uh, supposedly the Dulce underground bases with what Thomas Costello brought forth, risked his life to bring, you know, pictures and um, manuals and I believe even one video, and he has since disappeared. But he 
risked his life to give confirmation of the strange nature, the Dr. Dr. Moreau type experimentation that is supposedly going on in these underground bases between a collaboration of the fallen angels with those that work in the black ops. It's a very evil and sinister thing, just like what they did back before the days of Noah, even before the creation of modern humanity. Berosus gives us an accounting of the many different hybrid-type creatures and beings that the fallen ones created before the Father created his own special creature, Adam and Eve. And he did so as a punishment to the fallen angels for trying to create a slave race, for trying to make fit extensions for themselves to possess and be able to uh, manipulate and act upon this plane of existence. Many of the people in this time will be empty in spirit. They will have sampaku, no life force in their eyes. As we get close to the time of the arrival of the purifier, there will be those who walk as ghosts through the city, through canyons they will have constructed. In their man-made mountains, those that walk through these places will be very heavy in their walk. It will appear almost painful as they take each step, for they will be disconnected from their spirit and the earth. After the arrival of the twins, they will begin to vanish before your eyes like so much smoke. Others will have great deformities, both in the mind and upon their bodies. There will be those who would walk in the body that are not from this reality. For many of the gateways that once protected us will be open. There will be much confusion, confusion between the sexes and children and their elders. This reminds me of the passage that I often quote about the serpent-headed be- uh, creatures, the reptilian shapeshifters, whom I've connected to the Nakash of Genesis chapter 3, the feathered serpent that is cited as being a bringer of wisdom, culture, and civilization to so many peoples from around the world. And I've read much of that mythology and uh, have quoted from much of that oral tradition in my books and my radio shows and my works and my videos to tie all of this together. And here again, we have another reference from a completely individual source speaking about the same thing that the Emerald Tablets of Thought, tablet number six, speaks about. And for those of you that are, you know, familiar with my work, you know exactly what it is that I'm talking about, where it says that um, when the blood is offered, you know, when but in, done in ritual, that they are able to possess and take over the bodies of humanity. And it also speaks about that this was how it was that they came to rule over humanity by taking over, invading the councils of the chiefs, those who are the chiefs of the world. And by occupying and possessing these individuals, they were able to take over and set forth their, um, what they want as an agenda, which is the New World Order, for as, um, as the focus and direction for world, even though it is adverse and totally against what is beneficial for the common good of humanity and for us as a collective, as a planet, as a people. 
All right. Continuing. And I'm almost done with the Hopi prophecies. I know we're quickly running out of time. I'm going to try to cover what I can, but as I said, I'm going to do a a series, an ongoing series, maybe two or three episodes on this particular topic that I'm speaking about so that I can bring more of this information and the strange connections that I found with, you know, the gospel and these things that are cited in so many varying and differing places. Says this. Life will get very perverted. There will be little social order in these times. Many will ask for the mountains themselves to fall upon them just to end their misery. Now, is that not a reference to... You know, in Revelation, I believe it's Revelation 6, where the elites that go into their underground bases, into their underground structures, and with the coming of the Lord and then realizing that they're not written into the book of life, that they ask for the stones to fall on them. They ask for the mountains to fall on them. And this is also the time where death will elude those that are seeking it. All right, continuing. So, many will ask for the mountains themselves to fall upon them just to end their misery. And still others will appear as if untouched for what is occurring. The ones who remember the original teachings and have reconnected their hearts and spirits those who remember who their mother and father is, the Pahana, who have left to live in the mountains and forests. When the purifier comes, we will see him first as a small red star, which will come very close and sit in our heavens watching us, watching us to see how well we have remembered the sacred teachings. I want to also say this before continuing, that in the very many passages which are connected to the destroyer from the Colburn Bible, it speaks about how this destroyer is red in appearance. And it also says that there is a red dust that follows it in its passing, and that when it comes close to the planet, it envelops the planet in this red dust which turns the ocean and the rivers blood red, which is also another one of the signs of the the day of the Lord. And so I'll, I'll tie all these things together when I go into the biblical text. And I'll I'll read, um, maybe in the next show, I'll read the passages which are connected to that particular dust and the phenomena because it speaks about it plainly in the Colburn Bible. This purifier will show us many miraculous signs in our heavens. In this way, we will know Creator is not a dream. Even those who do not feel their connection to spirit will see the face of creator across the sky. Things unseen will be felt very strongly. Many things will begin to occur that will not make sense, for reality will be shifting back in and out of the dream state. There will be many doorways to the lower world that will open at this time. Things long forgotten will come back to remind us of our past creation. All living things will want to be present for this day when time ends and we enter the forever cycle of the fifth world. Um, Remember, you know, in... In the gospel, it speaks about the release 
of the locust army. And it also speaks about in Joel chapter 2 as the return of the Nephilim and the giants, which are also connected to the locust army. It speaks about the release of the four angels from the river Euphrates, from the place of Dudael where they have been um, imprisoned for, you know, for a specific time and place, which at the end of days they will be loosed again, and that Apollyon Abaddon, he who holds the key to the bottomless pit, when he is released, he also will herald and usher in the release of the giants and all kind of strange and unnatural creatures and beings that we have not seen and been witness to since the days of Noah. Remember Christ said in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, that as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the second coming of the Son of Man. It's the same thing. Check the chat room real quick. Welcome everybody else that has joined us, uh, Cairo and Gray and all the many guests and um, John. We've got a a lot of people that have joined us and a lot of um, people that I I don't recognize that are, you know, new listeners. So I appreciate all of you, Uh, Sherry, and uh, there's some names I can't even see, but uh, Yahushua Reigns, thank all of you, Truth Now, for joining us. I appreciate your fellowship, and I appreciate your questions, and I thank you for your integrity. And, I, you know, I honor all of you for the, you know, the beautiful um, dialogue that you share with each other in the chat room when I'm not able to, to monitor uh, Ruth, Watcher Ruth, wants to know what I'm reading from. This is the prophecy, the Hopi prophecy, on the um, return of the blue and the red star Kachina, which is also s- spoken about in Revelation as wormwood, uh, and is spoken about in the Colburn Bible as being the destroyer. Now, we know that... Um, we know that the Vatican has set up their Lucifer telescope to monitor and to watch for the return of Planet X or Nibiru. Same thing, same phenomena, just different names, different definitions, but all the same thing. God bless all of you too. All right, continue. We will receive many warnings, allowing us to change our ways from below the earth as well as above. Then one morning, in a moment, we will awaken to the red dawn. Remember I told you about the, you know, the red dust that is accompanied with this particular phenomena? This is what is being cited right here again. The same thing as when Revelation speaks about the Oceans and the rivers and the streams turning blood red. The sky will be the color of blood. Many things will then begin to happen that right now we are not sure of their exact nature. For much of reality will not be as it is now. There will be many strange beasts upon the earth in those days. Some from the past and some that we have never seen. The nature of mankind will appear strange in these times. We will walk between the worlds, and we will house many spirits even within our bodies. Same thing as what I was speaking about just a little bit earlier. After a time, we will again walk with our brothers, From the stars, 
and rebuild this earth, but not until the purifier has left his mark upon the universe. No thing living will go untouched, here or in the heavens. The way through this time, it is said, is to be found in our hearts and reuniting with our spiritual self, getting simple and returning to living with and upon the earth and in harmony with her creatures. Remembering that we are the caretakers, the fire keepers of the spirit, our relatives from the stars are coming home to see how we have fared in our journey. Now, I would equate what they're speaking about here as being the return of Yahushua and his legions of angels and not the ancient aliens that are going to parade around as our creator. Because remember, Satan comes first. The Antichrist comes first. And then Yahushua comes to settle the score, to separate the harvest, the wheat from the tares, the goat from the sheep, the wise from the foolish virgins, those who follow the left-hand path from those who follow the right, the seed of the serpent from the seed of the woman, the line of Cain, from the line of Seth. So just know that because I don't want you to get caught up in the strange, uh, the strong delusion. All right. Now, I'm trying to decide what it is I'm going to go into because I'm not going to have uh, too much more time. So I think the next text that I'm going to bring forth and that we'll go into is from the Ascension of Isaiah. The Ascension of Isaiah, which is an incredibly profound book. It's part of the pseudepigraphal text um, from first century, you know, first century CE. And this particular text gives a revelation of, just like the second book of Enoch, Isaiah, in this text, is taken up through the ten heavens. And he's also brought into the ten heavens to be a witness to the Father sending his son, Yahushua, down through the heavens to incarnate into the body of Mary as a child. And he also is in vision, witness to how he lives and brings forth his ministry and then is crucified. And after being crucified, rises again three days later and then, um, you know, a, you know, in the in between the three days, he ascends down into hell, and he breaks open the gates of brass, the doors of iron, and leads all of the patriarchs that were then in Sheol as part of the first resurrection back into paradise. And uh, Isaiah, in this particular text, is given a vision of all these things. But he also makes mention of the last days and gives reference to the times that we are in right now. From the Ascension of Isaiah. And they will teach all the nations in every tongue of the resurrection of the Beloved. Now, I'm skipping forward. I'm not going to read the entire text, but I'm um, pinpointing just that part that is relevant to our generation. And those who believe in his cross will be saved and his ascension into the seventh heaven whence he came. 
and that many who believe in him will speak through the Holy Spirit. And many signs and wonders will be wrought in those days. And afterwards, on the eve of his approach, his disciples will forsake the teachings of the twelve apostles and their faith and their love and their purity. And there will be much contention on the eve of his advent and his approach. And in those days, many will love office, though devoid of wisdom. There will be many lawless elders and shepherds dealing wrongly by their own sheep. And they will ravage them, owing to their not having holy shepherds. And many will change the honor of the garments of the saints for the garments of the covetous. And there will be much respect of persons in those days and lovers of the honor of this world. And there will be much slander and vain glory at the approach of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit will withdraw from many. And there will not be in those days many prophets, nor those who speak trustworthy words, save one here and there in diverse places. On account of the spirit of error and fornication and of vainglory and of covetousness, which shall be in those who will be called servants of that one, and in those who will receive that one. And there will be great hatred in the shepherds and elders towards each other. For there will be great jealousy in the last days, for everyone will say what is pleasing in his own eyes. And they will make of none effect the prophecy of the prophets, which were before me, And these, my visions also, will they make of none effect in order to speak after the impulse of their own hearts. That was from chapter 3 of the Ascension of Isaiah. I'm going to read now a a little bit from chapter 4, and then we'll see where we are. Um. And I might be able to go into one other text. And now Hezekiah and Joseph, my son, these are the days of completion of the world. After it is consummated, Beliar, the great ruler, the king of this world, will descend who hath ruled in it since it came into being. Yea, He will descend from his firmament in the likeness of a man, a lawless king, the slayer of his mother, who himself, even this king. Uh, Remember in Isaiah chapter 14, in Ezekiel chapter 28, it says that in the last days, Satan or who is referred to as Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14, that he will take on the likeness of a man and that he will be brought to the death of a man in sight of those who worship him as God and as as king. And so, and for those that um, don't know what I'm speaking about, refer to Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 because both of them are are well-known scriptures and passages that are associated to Satan and to uh, his place of habitation before his fall. Speaking about, you know, what he was like and who he was before being banished from the heavens, uh, when iniquity was found within him. All right. Continuing. He 
He will persecute the plant which the twelve apostles of the beloved have planted. Of the twelve, one will be delivered into his hands. This ruler in the form of that king will come, and there will come and there will come with him all the powers of this world, and they will hearken unto him in all that he desires. And at his word, the sun will rise at night, and he will make the moon to appear at the sixth hour. And all that he hath desired, he will do in the world. He will do and speak like the beloved, and he will say, I am God, and before me there has been none. And all the people in the world will believe in him, and they will sacrifice to him, and they will serve him, saying, This is God, and beside him there is no other. And they, greater number of those who shall have been associated together in order to receive the beloved, he will turn aside after him. And there will be the power of his miracles in every city and region. And he will set up his image before him in every city. And he shall bear sway three years and seven months and 27 days. Remember that um, the Antichrist rules for the last three and a half years of tribulation? And also remember that the false prophet, whom is, according to the prophecy of Malachi, is the current pope that is sitting in office that was just introduced after the resignation of Pope Benedict. That Pope Francis will be the false prophet that reigns in and heralds in the reign of the Antichrist. So it's my opinion that we are already halfway into the tribulation and that it will be soon that the Antichrist will be revealed. And according to Daniel's timeline, for those that haven't studied it, look into Daniel's timeline, 70 weeks of Daniel. He explains this as well. And he speaks about how the last seven years of tribulation will be ended with the sign of Revelation 12, with the woman clothed with the sun, the moon beneath her feet, a child within her womb, and a crown of 12 stars, that this particular celestial phenomena will take place on the Feast of Trumpets 2017. Now, I'm not saying that this is when you know, Christ will return or that this is when uh, the rapture will occur as being on the last day, the last trump. I'm just saying that September 23rd, 2017, that that will be the day when the sign of revelation takes place. Because the woman clothed in the sun is the constellation of Virgo. And the sun will be behind the constellation of Virgo on this particular day. And it will also fulfill all of the other aspects of Revelation 12. Excuse me for just a minute. For those that are not familiar, look it up for yourself. Look up the particular passage that I'm speaking about. And this particular phenomena, this, all the aspects of what is written in Revelation 12 there will occur and be fulfilled according to the stellarium and to those uh, starry night, those different astrological programs where you can look at 
what is occurring in the heavens on a particular date, that that day, Revelation 12 will be fulfilled. All right, continuing. And many believers and saints, having seen him for whom they were hoping, who was crucified, Jesus the Lord Christ, after that I, Isaiah, had seen him who was crucified and ascended, and those also who were believers in him, of these few in those days will be left as his servants, while they flee from desert to desert, awaiting the coming of the beloved. And after 1,332 days, the Lord will come with his angels and with the armies of the holy ones from the seventh heaven, with the glory of the seventh heaven, and he will drag Beliar into Gehenna and also his armies. So see, this is after the reign of the Antichrist. So as we said, the Antichrist will appear first. He will persecute the saints, just as it says in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and that at the last trump, last day, that Christ will return with his legion of holy angels, and the harvest will ensue. Just as it also speaks about in the book of Enoch, which is another book that I will be citing in this series, um, but I know it won't be today. I will probably only have time to finish this uh, scripture from the Ascension of Isaiah. But as I said, I will make it an ongoing series, and I'm going to try to bring forth all of the different texts that are tied to and associated to what I'm speaking from now. And he will give rest of the godly whom he shall find in the body in this world, and the son will be ashamed. And to all who, because of their faith in him, have execrated Beliar and his king, but the saints will come with the Lord with their garments, which are now stored up on high in the seventh heaven. With the Lord they will come, whose spirits are clothed. They will descend and be present in the world, and he will strengthen those who have been found in the body, together with the saints, in the garments of the saints. And the Lord will minister to those who have kept watch in this world. And afterwards, they will turn themselves upward in their garments, and their body will be left in this world. Almost done. Then the voice of the beloved will in wrath rebuke the things of heaven and the things of the earth and the things of the earth and the mountains and the hills and the cities and the desert and the forest and the angel of the sun and that of the moon and all things wherein Beliar manifested himself and acted openly in this world and there will be a resurrection and a judgment in their midst in those days, and the beloved will cause fire to go forth from him, and it will consume all the godless, and they will be as though they had not been created. Remember Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28 also speak about how Satan, or Beliar as referenced here, will be killed by a fire from within that the Lord will speak a word and this fire will consume him from inside out and burn him uh, and eradicate him from existence so that he will be as if he had never been. I think I have time to go through one more quick passage from Joel chapter 2. Let me check the chat room real quick. Um, I, I know that, you know, some of this is, is scary and that it's, you know, difficult for people to, um, to grasp going through, 
But know that the Father and the Son can protect all people anywhere. Just be on his side. Develop a relationship with him. Be under his wing of protection. You've got nothing to worry about. All right, real quick, because many of you are very familiar with the passage that I'm going to go into. Um, P.R. Kohler says that the Colburn is not scripture. Absolutely, it's not. And that's why I cited that it's written from the Celtic and Druidic and Egyptian perspective and that they, in fact, deny Christ as Savior and Messiah. I spoke about that in the very beginning of the show before you you came into the chat room. So, But anyways, I'm covering this from many, many different perspectives. And, um, you know, the Colburn is just one of those historical confirmations. So, anyways. And I don't, you know, I, even the Hopi prophecies, they're not scripture either. But they align to what is written in scripture. Okay. No worries. No worries, uh, PR. All right, continuing. Joel chapter 2, real quick. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people, now this is speaking about the return of the fallen angels and the giants right here. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. As a strong people set in battle array, before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Before their faces, the people shall be... Oh, I read that part. Okay, all right. Um, skipping. Neither shall one thrust one another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? One last thing. Let me pull this up real quick. Let me see if I can. I don't know if I'll have time, but let me see if I can read one final thing for you in concluding this this teaching. Okay. All right, I think I've got it. Hold on one second. Okay, these particular passages that I've been reading from, they are also associated to what is spoken about in uh, Matthew chapter 24 
and in Revelation where it speaks about the sixth uh, seal. It says this. Um, immediately, this is from Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Remember, it says, after the tribulation of those days. Now, the sixth seal from Revelation 6 says this. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Revelation 6, verse 12. A few verses later. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Remember in the Hopi prophecy where it speaks about uh, that those that go into their underground bases that are trying to hide from the wrath of the Lamb? It's the same thing as being spoken about right here in Revelation 6. And so I'm going to have to end it there. I will pick up and follow, uh, follow through with this teaching on the next show. Um, I apologize. I, I don't plan on taking calls because I just don't know if I can trust it. You know, with all the trolls that have been um, following the show and that have been trying to disrupt it, but at some point, if I do know you and I see that you've been in the chat room for a long time uh, and I can trust you, I will open up the phone lines and take your calls. Um, but I, I just don't want to give any space and time to those that, you know, have been trolling and, and uh, disrupting the program. So. So I just pray that the Father leads you and guide you in discernment and protect and watch over you, your families, your children. And again, believe nothing that I say. Study all this for yourself. Confirm it for yourself. Take it to the Lord and ask him for discernment on all these things. Yahushua, Yahuwah bless all of you. Till next Saturday. God bless all.
Good night, all. God bless.